Welcome everyone to our critical care nephrology induction meeting. Uh, this meeting is very important uh, for all of you and all uh, of our board member as well. Um, last month, we have our first orientation meeting and today we are going to give you more information about our critical care nephrology fellowship. I'm going to give you some introduction about the program. Then Dr. Khaled Swifi is going to give you um, some background about the structure and the handbook uh, of the uh, fellowship. Then he's going to show you um, a small um, presentation about point of care ultrasound. Then Dr. Craig is going to show you some of the samples of the MCQs that you will have during the whole entire fellowship program. Then Dr. Uh, Kamel Al-Attar is going to show you how to handle the CRRT machine and the prescription and how to deal with the clotting problems on the machine. Then we'll end by Dr. Jacobo uh, from Portugal. He is going to give a small uh, brief presentation about hepatorenal syndrome. Here is our uh, program board member. I am Amr Hosseini. I'm a professor of nephrology at University of Kentucky. Dr. Craig is uh, from South Africa, Cape Town, and uh, he is a nephrologist. nephrologist. Jacobo is uh, originally from Spain and he is working in Portugal. He's a critical care medicine um, expert. Um, Rola Othman is a nephrologist in, in Noor uh, Hospital in Mecca. Wakar Kashev is an American board certified nephrologist and also a board certified in critical care nephrology. Uh, Dr. Khalid Sawifi is a critical care physician who works in the MAM. Dr. Ashraf Al Attar is also an intensivist who works in uh, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Marcos Broman he is an uh, intensivist from Switzerland. Dr. Ricardo Matas, he is a senior consultant intensive care physician uh, in Portugal. And Professor Yasser Abdul Hamid, he is a professor of nephrology at Cairo University. Why we are focusing on critical care nephrology? This is one of the most important uh, uh, fields uh, in nephrology and critical care. And uh, usually um, these patients are critically ill and these are all challenging cases. And if not treated appropriately and precisely, they might have devastating consequences. And there is huge management gap uh, from both the nephrology and the critical care sides and there is no consistency or consensus in major aspects how to treat uh, these patients. We need to build up a uh, um, you know, panel of expertise in this field uh, in the uh, you know, whole entire world, especially in the developing countries. And this uh, program is structured as three modules, 16 weeks each, and this is a real education. It is not a webinar or seminar or one direction education, it's a dialogue rather than monologue. And uh, this program, uh, we are going to evaluate the fellows on weekly basis and to deliver them uh, scientific material and uh, uh, to let them to do critical thinking and appraisal. And we are going to gather uh, a panel of expertise. It's a wholly online fellowship. It's based on asynchronized education. We are only going to meet uh, every four weeks in a live webinar. But apart from this, everything will be recorded in a smart platform. And all fellows will have the freedom to navigate through the whole uh, educational material, starting from each Monday morning till Sunday night. They can read the article. They can watch the recorded video. They can do their tests and assignments with MCQs, clinical case scenarios, and journal club. And they have the whole week to do this. Uh, they can do it you know, over the weekdays or uh, weekends, day and night. So this gives them freedom. So they don't have to gather 
to do the tasks and the assignments. We are only meeting every four weeks for an hour in a live webinar. And all activities of the fellows are already registered and monitored in the smart platform. And the, the main objective is educational. We are not going to uh, let them fail the fellowship based on uh, their score, at least at the beginning. We are just monitoring their progress and their engagement as long as they are doing their part and they are contributing and learning, they should be fine. Till the end of the, each module, there will be a semi-final exam. Then uh, there will be an exit exam before the end of the fellowship. The application deadline is by the end of this month, so only uh, two weeks left. So if you haven't finalized your application, please go ahead and finalize your application and acceptance of notification will be on Monday, May 6. Uh, we will uh, have onboarding meeting on Wednesday, May 15. So please attend this meeting. We'll give you more and more information about the fellowship. And the fellowship should start on Monday, May 20. Um, and this is the time that all the fellows will have the uh, materials on the platform. They will have the credential with username and password. So they will have access to the platform and they will uh, be able to see the scientific material and to get engaged and to do their tasks and assignments. And we are expecting uh, for all the fellows, um, you know, who are going to graduate from this one year wholly online program to be experts in the field and to graduate to a trainer and the mentor level from a mentee or trainee level. And of course, they are going to receive an American certificate with a graduation certificate with 96 credit hours uh, of uh, a certification in critical care nephrology. If you cannot afford to be part of this because of the tuition fee, we are offering a scholarship uh, for uh, the low income countries it's a competitive process and you have to submit uh, several documentation to make sure that you are going to help your unprivileged communities and the low income countries and uh, your income is low in these countries. Uh, so the chosen uh, fellows will be either sponsored completely or partially by our program. So please, uh, we are going to um, have a subcommittee and will announce the scholarship process within a couple of days. So if you cannot afford the tuition fees, you can apply for this competitive scholarship. I'm going to stop by here, and I really appreciate uh, uh, all of your presence today. And I will let uh, uh, Dr. Khaled Sawifi, who is academic uh, uh, director of our fellowship, to share his screen. And he is going to give you uh, more information about the structure of our uh, program. Then he will give you a brief presentation about the Bocas Point of Care Ultrasound. <clears throat> uh, good evening all. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you again. And I hope uh, my presentation will be of value for all of you and you, it will answer all your questions. Uh, critical Care and Nephrology Fellowship, as we mentioned before, it, it, it comes into two different flavors. Uh, uh, you will learn really a, a, a critical care, how to manage patient at life threatening emergencies. Uh, to stabilize at the same time uh, really how to uh, handle the uh, nephrology uh, tracks and how to operate the CRRT and how to improve the outcome of uh, those categories of vision. Uh, so that's why Critical Care uh, Fellowship is very unique. Um, we will be an expert in dialyzing patient in critical care area with all uh, uh, troubleshooting. We'll, we will highlight uh, uh, every single point uh, 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 as an obstacle when you are dealing with critical care nephrology patient. For example, when you look for the uh, uh, CRT in ICU, 
uh, it is a, a kind of a washing machine. And uh, the setting of the washing machine will decide how much uh, solid clearance will be. So you have to be a clever uh, to able to modulate well uh, those categories of patient. So uh, uh, it, the syllabus composed of three modules. Uh, uh, the first module will be around foundation of critical care nephrology. The second module title will co is called like the specific nephrological syndromes in critical care nephrology. And the latest one, like I talk about advanced critical care nephrology issues. The detailed program uh, uh, will will have like uh, uh, each module will uh, will be will will continue for 16 weeks. Uh, and each module have three mini modules or three chap chapters. Is each chapter made of three main uh, uh, topics, and each topic run for one week. Uh, followed by uh, at the end of the uh, module, we'll have a case presentation and discussion, and uh, like a, a discussion webinar after each topic at week four. Uh, module one uh, will focus on introduction. Uh, acute kidney injury, uh, three lecture, uh, CRT, three lecture, uh, definition, strategy, volume assessment, epidemiology, staging, acid base disorders in critical ill patient. Uh, we'll speak about details of CRT. We'll speak about uh, prescription, uh, uh, anticoagulation issue, including citrate, uh, troubleshooting, uh, including all kind of alarms. And we have here uh, a virtual workshop uh, regarding how to prescribe and another workshop, how to troubleshoot uh, problem when you are dealing with CRT. Uh, module two will go to a uh, shock stage and will we'll, we'll, uh, learn about septic AKI, uh, polytrauma, cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, we'll uh, go deeply to the liver issue of multi-organ dysfunction with acute liver failure, MARS, and how to dialyze patient with liver disease. Hepatorenal syndrome, acute kidney injury in the setting of multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Uh, also, we we'll speak about uh, uh, three lecture about renal replacement therapy uh, with ECMO, integrated with ECMO and LVAD. And also, we we'll speak about drugs and how to uh, modify the dosage of drugs during CRT. Uh, uh, in module three, we will go more advanced. And we'll uh, will uh, get some helpful tools in three lecture nutrition quality uh, focus uh, point of care ultrasound uh, novel critical care treatment approaches uh, uh, with four lectures including Essex and safety echo and extracorporeal blood verification therapy researches issues and artificial intelligence uh, at the end uh, we'll have uh, uh, an exam. And you have to pass the exam to uh, get the uh, final certificate. So it is a crystal clear that uh, critical care nephrology fellowship is very beneficial, uh, very unique. And uh, I'm always, I, I like the uh, uh, words of uh, uh, Einstein when he mentioned clearly, you have to learn the role of the game and then you can play it better than anyone else. So uh, with uh, knowledge, is, is, uh, you can really improve. Uh, your skills and uh, you can improve the life of critical ill um, yeah, Thank you very much. Uh, this topic is the syllabus. Uh, Dr. Amr will speak uh, here about the focus. So uh, when we talk about uh, critical care ultrasound, we cannot forget the kidney and how uh, to really examine the patient from head to toe to know uh, what is the etiology of acute kidney injury and uh, how to manage those complex categories of patients. So like, for example, a case scenario here, a 48-year-old uh, male patient with history of chronic liver disease admitted to the hostel because of the AKI grade 3 with acute rise in serum creatinine to 4 mg uh, per deciliter, the abdomen is markedly standard. So here, how to manage this patient? How you are going to manage? What are you going to do next? Uh, instead of sending patient to imaging uh, department or for ultrasound, you can have a focus. You have ultrasound at your unit. When you do the ultrasound here, you find clearly that there is a huge 
amount of ascites compressing the renal vessels and reducing renal blood flow. When you go and you put uh, uh, the catheter in, you're able to uh, reduce the amount of fluid, reduce the intra-abdominal pressure, and you're able to do increase the uh, 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 renal blood flow and patient can uh, have return of renal function. So nowadays the uh, point of care ultrasound is increasing uh, used in patient managed in ICU uh, in different issue. If you look for the history uh, of uh, using ultrasound uh, in medicine, and generally started in 17th century, uh, but the, it started to introduce in ICU in late 1990s. And since that time, it's getting more and more credibility. Uh, when you are uh, talking about abdominal ultrasound, we will uh, uh, have uh, two uh, probes. So we use uh, a cardiac probe and use abdominal probe. Uh, we'll learn together how to do that uh, in a focus lecture. But you have to understand that the, uh, uh, the abdominal uh, convex probe is a low frequency probe, so we can go deeply to check the deep tissue. Uh, when you look uh, for the right kidney, you have to focus on putting the probe at the mid axillary line, while the left kidney, you choose the posterior axillary line. Uh, don't forget the adrenal artery originates from abdominal aorta below the level of severe mesenteric artery. Uh, also, you have to understand that renal vein uh, drain into inferior vena cava. Uh, what you want to look for, uh, important when you use uh, BOCUS for renal vision to uh, first use the uh, echo probe to look at the cardiac output uh, and the left ventricle, left side of the heart. Uh, then you look for the IVC sites, collapsibility and distensibility. You look for the urinary bladder for obstruction. You look for the kidney size and echogenicity. You look for the Morrison pouch for any increase in abdominal pressure. You, you look uh, with the color doubler and the uh, pulsed wave doubler to look at the resistive uh, index, uh, it's called RI. Uh, so the main target to differentiate between the pre-renal, uh, is the patient hypovolemic, low cardiac output, decreased renal perfusion, or patient has already established renal uh, failure with acute tubular necrosis, or patient has obstruction with both renal uh, causes. Uh, in the pre-renal, uh, we focus on the cardiac output and volume uh, issues. If you look at this uh, actually uh, picture, you need to understand, uh, do you need to give fluid for this patient or not? Uh, uh, here, clearly you can see that the uh, LV is kissing, uh, both in left basternal view and also in the short axis view. So patient really need to give tons of fluid to improve uh, the renal perfusion. Uh, so the patient is very dry. Uh, so uh, which one needs IV fluid from these two pictures? The picture up or down? You can write on the chat. If you look to the picture down, you can see the left ventricle is contracting uh, very well and nearly kissing. So you don't need really to get fluid here. But if you give, if you look at the barasternal view up here, you can see really the ventricle is, is poorly contracting the left ventricle, and this patient need inotropes, doesn't need fluid. So when we go for the IVC diameter, we will look at one, we have one out of three options. So uh, initially you put the uh, abdominal probe, convex abdominal probe, long uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in vertical uh, um, dimension, and you press uh, towards the zip sternum, and uh, you look at the IVC. So the IVC is, uh, you have to one of three options, if uh, the IVC more than 2.1 centimeters, so it's dilated, and collapse, collapse, collapsibility less than 50%, uh, it means that patient is really uh, overloaded and CVB is more than 15. If you go and look at the IVC, and you found it is less than 2.1 centimeter, collapsibility more than 50%, uh, which uh, the CVB is usually between zero to five, and the, uh, any other combination, it means a CVB between 10 or around 10 to 15. 
So uh, uh, in the spontaneous breathing patient, you, you look for the IVC diameter and collapsibility, while in mechanically ventilated, you look at the distance, civility, uh, 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 index, uh, and uh, if the distance civility index showing that percentage more than 12%, it means that patient is fluid responsive. It's very, very important, really, tool to look at it. Uh, second, uh, so if you look here at the uh, the IVC, clearly you will find this is the right atrium, and the IVC is draining into the right atrium. This is the hepatic vein, and you need to measure the IVC uh, just uh, proximal to the hepatic vein here. I actually ideally should be around, uh, around three centimeter from the uh, right atrium. Uh, how to measure it? You need to have to take a uh, 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 to be perpendicular to the uh, to the axis, uh, and you take the measurement as I uh, draw here. So perpendicular to the plane, distal to the hepatic vein, uh, one to three centimeter from right atrium, from the inner to inner edge. You can use simply eyeballing to see the IVC is dilated and uh, or not, or collapse bile or not. Uh, uh, you can go and get uh, two dimension, and uh, in the uh, after two dimension, you get the M mode, and the M mode you can see that the uh, IVC is getting to get dilated uh, during the uh, expiration, and during inspiration get uh, collapsed by collapsed during expiration, uh, and you can calculate the collapsibility index and to know really is a patient is uh, uh, fluid responsive or not. Uh, then you go for the renal, and then here is the renal size and the echogenicity uh, is important. And then you go for Doppler to look at the resistive index. Uh, if you look at the kidney here, it's important to understand that it composed of the cortex and the medulla. The medulla is actually, uh, the cortex is gray, the medulla is white, and is a pyramid in the middle. And uh, uh, if you go to the right side, you find the liver adjacent to the kidney. The left side, you find the spleen adjacent to the kidney. And uh, important to know that uh, uh, the uh, uh, echogenicity of the kidney should be hypochoic to the liver, which is uh, uh, normal. If they start to be uh, an index to be one or two, and you find this echogenic uh, same like liver or, or higher, Echogenesis than the liver, so more bright than the liver, the patient in grade two nephropathy. Uh, uh, the lens uh, is important to measure. It is uh, the longitudinal lens is uh, nine, nine to twelve. Anything less than nine means the kidney is shrunken. Uh, if you go to the uh, uh, color doubler, you put the color doubler over the kidney. And uh, when you look at the, uh, the kidney, uh, you will find uh, the arterial, which is uh, going towards the transducer, and the venous going away from transducer. You press the color doubler on the uh, arterial, and then you uh, press on the pulsed wave doubler. And uh, then you get uh, the uh, peak systolic velocity. Uh, and uh, uh, in diastolic velocity, uh, you get the resistive index. If you have the, uh, like Mendray ultrasound or ultrasound with the soft renal software, it will give you immediately when you press on the pulse wave doubler, uh, the uh, resistive index. If you don't have, and you have regular ultrasound, what you need to do is to uh, have a, a manual measurement, like a big systolic minus uh, end diastolic over the big systolic you give you the resistive index. Normally, it should be between 0.5 to 0.7. Uh, anything above 0.75 indicating acute renal. Uh, anything below 7, it is uh, uh, indicating pre-renal. So pre-renal, still, you need really to focus increasing renal perfusion with fluid and inotropes and vasopressors. Uh, so still have a hope to reverse the early acute kidney injury. But if, like, develop ATN already, as uh, it's quite late and maybe focus on supportive care and dialysis. Uh, then don't forget to look at the obstruction and uh, just simply he put the uh, abdominal probe transverse uh, down above symph symphysis pubis and uh, uh, looking downward and you will find the bladder either it is full 
means that you have an orbital the, or the prostate or uh, you have the uh, castor obstruction. Uh, here is important, really. Uh, if Bishna doesn't have castor, you need to put castor. If the castor is blocked, you need to uh, open it up uh, or prostate has to be removed. Uh, so, a summary of my talk, um, uh, of course, this is very uh, highlighted uh, slides, uh, not all lecture, of course, but important to look for the cardiac output, uh, the patient uh, casing, ventricle needs to do it, or need inotropes, you need to look at the IVC, and uh, you go for M mode to measure collapsibility index, or you measure distance stability index if the patient mechanically ventilated, you need to look at the bladder and look at his full bladder or not, or bladder does not have fluid. I need to look for the uh, the kidney, uh, the longitudinal size, the size, as well as the echogenicity, uh, as well as you need to go with color doubler and uh, pulse wave doubler. Look at the big systolic velocity and uh, end systolic velocity and resistive uh, index to know you are still in the renal uh, phase of the acute uh, uh, ATM phase. Um, I hope the lecture will be uh, of value of all of you. And of course, if you need any question, I, I am with you here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khaled. That's a very nice demonstration. I'm not this old, but I remember uh, when I did my training uh, in nephrology uh, almost three decades ago, uh, we, every one of us in the residency program used to have the stethoscope. I think nowadays this is part of the training that everyone, uh, resident or fellow, either in critical care, uh, ICU or nephrology, need to have a portable uh, ultrasound machine and need to practice and learn how to do the bocas because it's very essential and sometimes it helps you instantly in evaluating your patient especially the volume status so i really encourage everyone in his training uh you know the, the young generation everyone who's early in his or her career to try to learn and practice the uh, point of care ultrasound and because this is uh, very essential we are going to focus on it in our fellowship program and actually we are thinking to dedicate uh, us you know a uh, separate program for a point of care artery sound in the future. Uh, now we are going to move uh, with uh, Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig uh, um, is a nephrologist in Cape Town in South Africa, and he is going to show us some samples of the MCQs that he is going to uh, teach during the course, and it's related to the CRRT. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, if, let me just get Get my screen going here. All right. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Craig Orenser. It's such a pleasure and such a privilege for me to be on this platform. I really find it a, a, an honor and thank, and I'm really working, I can tell you all, with a very good team of uh, leaders and specialists and professors who are really uh, looking forward to making this a very uh, a good experience for all of you. So this is a very good course, and I think the format of it is excellent. The only thing that I miss is traveling to, to different places of the world. So we all come from different places. I'm, uh, by means of introduction, I'm from South Africa and, uh, and a small little town right at the bottom of South Africa is called Cape Town. Uh, and I've got a couple of colleagues. I think they are, most of them are on this platform. Uh, shout out to some of my South African colleagues who are from various uh, towns and cities in, in Cape Town. Um, I did my, so when you come to my city and you fly in with the airport, you see this beautiful scene. Uh, this is Cape Town. Uh, this is the Atlantic seaboard down at the bottom here and Table Mountain. And uh, if you go right to the little corner there, I did my, uh, my university training at uh, the University of Cape Town. Um, I also went ahead and did specialized training through the university. And uh, this is the hospital, the famous Krutuskir Hospital, where Christian Barna did the first heart transplant. And this is where I did my nephrology training 
um, until I then left to, to work in the private track in private uh, uh, private practice. So let's uh, sorry one second. So I've been tasked to give you a little bit of an insight on how we are going to teach you guys uh, and what format we are going to learn through. And most, if not, I think 90% of how you're going to learn uh, nephrology and critical care medicine is going to be in the format of a clinical multiple choice question. And um, I can tell you this, that we have had been schooled in how to write multiple choice questions, mostly from really given each one of us a very uh, a big lesson in, in how to write these questions. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to always sketch for you a real life clinical case-based scenario. And I can certainly tell you that when I've been doing cases and in many instances, I've taken cases from the very same week that I was writing those cases, to make it as real and as, as virtual as possible. We then want to test your, your existing knowledge. And this is not so that we can uh, make fun of people getting it right or wrong. No, we want to see what you would do in a certain, uh, given a certain amount of choices. And then we would come to providing you with updated evidence-based practice changing information. And I think that's the whole point of this whole exercise is for us to impart knowledge uh, that is up to date and uh, and what and that you can use in your practices uh, and change your practices. Now, most of the questions, in fact, all of the questions really should have a theme, and I've put a theme to this. Um, to this, uh, so you might ask, what does uh, filter coffee have to do with um, critical care disease? Well, there's a lot of filtering happening. Uh, in, in my office when I drink coffee, but there's also a lot of filtering happening when we do dialysis. So in Critical Care Nephrology Fellowship, we have this as a format. We will present for you a case presentation. Then we will offer you a clinical question and we will give you five possible answers. You will then have an opportunity to choose those answers uh, of which naturally one of them is correct. And then we will go through an answer explanation. And this is really where the whole point of the thing is that we want to be able to explore the different, even the incorrect answers. We want to be able to explore why those answers are incorrect and what makes the correct answer uh, the correct one. So let's use as an example, a case that I have. And this is a, a case of a 68 year old female who has had abdominal surgery for an acute ruptured appendicitis. Very standard stock case. And I, I think most of us, most of you have, have had this kind of scenario many times in recent times. Unfortunately for this lady, she has perioperative complications and runs into major problems requiring large volume uh, fluid as well as blood resuscitation. She remains quite unstable for the 72 hours and, 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 and on inotropes and becomes progressively anuric. And by 72 hours, her creatinine is 378 millimoles per liter or 4.3 milligrams per deciliter. Um, the IV fluids that are still on board is about 40 mils per hour of Ringer's lactate. Uh, antibiotics are being given and that amounts to about 20 mils per hour. And she's still on a low dose of IV adrenaline. And for a 24 hour period, this is our obligatory, at least IV intake. Unfortunately, uh, ventilator requirements worsen and uh, the surgeon now becomes very concerned that he's dealing with uh, pulmonary edema. We order an X-ray and that is the X-ray picture that is seen. The surgeon then calls either the intensivist or the nephrologist and, and urgently requests dialysis with ultrafiltration. Now, the surgeon, we always joke with our surgeons in hospital, if they know what, what big words mean, then we always, uh, we always find them very impressive. But I think not many, not many people that work in an ICU do not understand what ultrafiltration is. 
We then go ahead and set up the prescription for the dialysis. And because the initial person at the bedside is usually the, the technician, that technician sets the dialysis machine up with a blood pump speed of 100 moles per minute. He programs a post-dilutional hemofiltration with a, with a pump speed of 2,400 uh, 2, moles per hour. And he sets the initial ultrafiltration rate at 150 moles per hour. That given uh, creates an ultrafiltration rate dose of 30 moles per kg per hour and an effluent dose of 30 moles per kg per hour. And the machine shows as a result of all of these settings, a filtration fraction of 57%. Now, if you haven't realized what my theme is by now, you, you, then you have missed the point already because how many times have we seen filtration? You'll be seeing filtration in the form of hemofiltration, ultrafiltration rate, ultrafiltration rate dose, and filtration fraction. I'm sure some of you who have, who have prescribed dialysis, and I'm sure most of you have, can already identify certain problems with this prescription. Uh, there's a very heavy, there's a very high filtration fraction, this one being the most obvious, and we need to understand what that means. There's a very uh, high ultrafiltration rate. To start a patient who's relatively, who's relatively unstable still at such a high ultrafiltration rate is quite daring. And then you see uh, an ultrafiltration rate dose is exactly equal to the effluent dose, and there must be something incorrect there as well. Well, you as the intensivist or nephrologist come along and you are you see that and these are the revised settings that you have decided on. You've decided to push the pump speed up to 150. You've decided to do to remain with post dilution hemofiltration but to add uh, and half of it on the post dilution. This then results, and, and because you thought that was too high, you then put your ultrafiltration rate at 50 moles per hour. Your effluent dose is exactly the same at 30 moles per kg per hour. And this measurement of ultrafiltration rate dose has changed from 30 to 16, with a filtration fraction that I think most of you would realize looks so much better than a filtration fraction of 57%. You then focus a little bit on what is happening with the fluids and you do a fluid uh, CRT fluid removal prescription. And for the first 24 hours, you want to be very tentative. You want to be very gentle on the patient. And here comes another term. You then introduce a net ultrafiltration rate intensity of between 0.5 to 1 moles per kg per hour. And your aim is to then later, between 24 and 72 hours, introduce a net ultrafiltration rate, which is approximately 80 to 160 moles per hour. So we've got all these filtration terms. And I think, you know, we can really come up with so many questions on this case. And this case is just filled with the possibility of questions. So this is the question that I've created. Which term? describes the process of fluid movement across the dialysis membrane, which is sufficient to yield a negative extracellular fluid balance. Let's ask it again. Which term describes the process of fluid movement across the dialysis membrane, which is sufficient to yield a negative extracellular fluid balance from the patient? Now, the whole point of that question is not to, is not to get everyone confused, but the five options that we've given you is are options that you need as a student to be able to not only say what those options mean and why they are false, but you've also then got to have a process of being able to, to eliminate the incorrect one so that ultimately we come to the correct answer. And once again, I've followed a theme. The theme here is not filter coffee, but the theme is the filtration. So I'd like to go back. Oh. I'd like to go back now and let's, before I give you the answer, let's start with an answer explanation. So the word filtration is used very frequently in renal replacement therapy practice 
With each variation thereof referencing a slightly different treatment or dose parameter related to CRRT. It is important that we as a unifying, that we as a group use unifying nomenclature so that everyone uses the same language with the same physiological and mechanistic understanding of these overlapping terms. So let's start with the basic one. Your first option was ultrafiltration rate. And that's something we measure in moles per hour. And it's abbreviated UF rate. And, and the, the term ultrafiltration or UF is something that we know very well, especially from the chronic dialysis arena, where we know that we ultrafiltrate a patient either equal to or greater than their interdialytic weight gain in order to render them with a negative extra with a negative extracellular water de deficit. When you're only using diffusive therapies, indeed, the amount of fluid that you remove is the same as ultrafiltration rate. But we should be careful when we're using CVVHD or CVVH, and that is when we are introducing convective therapies. And here, the ultrafiltration rate refers to something slightly different, or, or, or as a broader reference, refers to ultrafiltration of all the fluids that is removed via convection. And it's this reason why some of the CRRT machines don't actually have this term ultrafiltration rate on the, on, the treatment, um, on the treatment screen. And the term used instead is patient fluid removal. And I really like that because it's a lot more specific about what you are trying to do with that particular setting. Um, so we don't really talk, uh, we can talk about ultrafiltration rate. And as I said, everyone understands what ultrafiltration is. But in CRRT, in particular, when we're using this machine, we will talk about specifically about patient fluid removal. And that is to avoid confusion when we are specifically referencing the hourly fluid removal intended for total body water reduction. Then we come to an interesting term called ultrafiltration rate dose and that also reflects on the screen very clearly I'm not sure how many people have ever thought about it and what it means and what it implies so the, so this ultrafiltration rate dose is the total ultrafiltration rate as we discussed in the first answer which is indexed to the patient's weight and that is the equation that the machine uses to calculate that number and essentially what you can do with this number is this is a quantitative measure of the effluent dose as contributed by convective therapies. Uh, so the effluent dose is, is one measure, but this is the effluent dose of the convective therapy. And it's also a qualitative measure of the clearance provided specifically by convective therapies, right? Because you are indexing it to the patient's weight. So it's, it's quantitative and qualitative at the same time. How would we use this in the clinical setting? Well, you can use it firstly to to classify your treatment as, the, as, as containing convective treatments, you have to increase ultrafiltration rate dose to at least more than 10 moles per kg per hour. So this therapy here would qualify as a therapy containing sufficient convective clearance to do what you want to do with convective clearance. The other usefulness of this term, of this uh, uh, phrase here, or this calculation is you can use it as an estimated creatinine clearance. Remember, we use effluent volume divided by 60 for the small molecular weight drugs. And this is the one we can use to estimate uh, clear, creatinine clearance for large and middle molecular drugs. Then this one is easy. I think everybody knows about what hemofiltration is. Hemofiltration is the passage of fluids across the semipermeable membrane under the influence of a pressure gradient. And when you're applying filtration, the CRRT machine is continuously pushing plasma from the intravascular to the effluent side. If you ever wonder where the word ultra come from, well, ultrafiltrate, the Latin suffix ultra refers to the fluid which goes beyond. So the ultrafiltrate is all the fluid that lands up in the effluent bag and has effectively been removed from the patient as an ultrafiltrate. Hemodiafiltration, which is the other word that contains filtration, is a, is, a, is a modality where both diffusive and convective therapies are used. And these are various factors that influence hemofiltration and diafiltration, which I won't go through uh, individually, but these are some of the things that we will discuss in our CRRT talk. Now for this 
filtration fraction. And I think filtration fraction is probably one of the most enigmatic terms used in CRRT. In its simplest terms, it can be seen as a crude measure of hemal concentration as blood traverses along the length of the filter and is subjected to more ultra filtration. And we can use it literally as an online measure of the risk of filter clotting. The minimum accepted level or the maximum level should never be more than 20. What makes this filtration fraction, in my opinion, such, an, such a difficult thing to understand by some people is because there's this very complex equation that we are expected to understand and use on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's not true. You will never really be asked to, 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 to calculate filtration fraction. It is calculated by the software, and that is that figure uh, seen on the CRRT machine. What is important to know, though, is what variables affect this number. And those variables include hematocrit, blood flow, and once again, the ultrafiltration rate, which we spoke about earlier. And then, as you might have concluded, my answer to the question is the so-called term called net ultrafiltration rate, abbreviated UFNet. Now, this is a fairly new concept in critical care practice in that it's a new concept that has only recently been written about and, and, and studied. And essentially, it is meant to represent a safe fluid removal, or is it meant to use as a tool to, to facilitate the safe fluid removal in the early resuscitative phase of fluid management. When your patient fluid removal is exactly the same as intravenous volume expanding fluids, there's effectively no let loss to the patient. But when your fluid removal exceeds the intravenous fluid infusions, you have an intravascular volume depletion, and then you've applied what we call a net ultrafiltration rate, which is the portion of fluid removal which actually yields a negative fluid balance. When we put this value as an indexed number, in other words, the, the fluid, the gross volume expressed as an index to the weight, this then becomes an intensity of fluid removal. And we can then refer to a so-called safe, unsafe ultrafilt net ultrafiltration rate, where the patient fluid removal is just too high. And you then can use the term safe ultrafiltration rate, which several authors, uh, especially this one we've referenced here, has done very good studies in and is shown to be a safe zone of ultrafiltration, so between 1 and 1.75 moles per kg per hour expressed as a net ultrafiltration rate. I think I've spoken enough, and I think that's a good example, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Craig. Very, very nice uh, demonstration. I really assure everybody, if you don't get the right answer, you will have the whole year to learn from Dr. Craig and uh, Dr. Ricardo and Jacob and uh, everybody in, in, in our board. Uh, so don't don't be panic, okay? Uh, you will have a chance to learn throughout the whole entire year. Um, now I'm going to play um, recorded video um, that uh, Dr. Um, Kamal Al-Attar recorded for, uh, for us. He is with us uh, for uh, any um, questions. He will be happy to address or answer any questions. So he recorded for us a couple of workshops with the CRRT machine. And this is just a sample of these workshops. What in the video known as arterial pressure and venous. 
and are going to replay that. And 0.5 post. 12 hours into CRRT, her access pressure uh, went from minus 100 to minus 60. What changes to the prescription would you make? For the next few minutes, we will put aside all our theoretical training, all our nephrology training, and we will focus on high school physics. We'll go back to just pure uh, pressure and physics. Now, for the next also few minutes, we will assume that I am the dialyzer. I am the filter. This is the axis, and this is the return, also known as arterial pressure and venous pressure. Always remember that axis pressure is negative because I'm taking away blood from the patient. So remember that return pressure is always positive because I'm returning blood to the patient. Now, three reasons could, we could have high axis pressure. What are these reasons? Well, high axis pressure means that there is a block after. What could cause block after the pressure? Clot in the filter would be the most common. A clot in the venous chamber would also be very common. Or a block in the return, the blue, the venous needle. Again, three reasons would cause a rise in the axis pressure. Number one, filter clotting, number two, venous chamber clotting, number three, the return axis block. Now, three reasons could also cause low axis pressure. Low axis means that the negative axis pressure, which is the most common alarm uh, you find in CRT. Mainly, you can see that where there is a axis problem, where minus 100 becomes minus 150 where you are trying to get blood from the patient and failing when do we see that we see that in the block in the arterial needle or the block in the arterial part of the catheter or a kinking of the arterial line these three causes would cause the access pressure to become more negative now when it comes to pressure going from minus 100 to minus 60 is that an increase or a decrease in access pressure the answer is, it is a rise in access pressure. Minus 60 is a higher number than minus 100. So what would a trained physician see when he has a rising access pressure? He would assume a clot in the filter, or a block in the filter, a block in the venous chamber, or a block in the return line, or the uh, blue part of the return line. How can we differentiate that? If we see that accompanied by a drop in the return, so high access low return can only mean one thing the filter itself is uh, the source of the pressure so there is a pressure accumulating inside the filter so what would the first thing i would do i would check the return see if the return is also becoming low going from 100 to 50 for example then i've already diagnosed that the filter is the problem now what kind of a problem is there in that filter we have two major uh, causes that would cause the filter pressure to rise. Of course, the infamous filter clotting, which means that we have a clot being formed, blocking those hollow fibers and increasing the pressure. The transmembrane pressure rises uh, uh, and therefore uh, uh, causes these alarms. The second one is clogging. What is filter clogging? Filter clogging is accumulation of fats and proteins on the membrane of the dialyzer. This clogging will also result in the same alarms and the same pressures rising. How can a trained physician differentiate between a filter clotting and a filter clogging? Another parameter you look at on the machine, which is in this case the filter pressure drop. Now, pressure drop is also displayed on the main screen. And it shows us the difference in the pressure between the filter inlet and the filter outlet. In normal CRT, there is always a difference between the filter inlet and the filter outlet because blood comes at a higher pressure in the inlet, and that pressure gradually declines as you go from the, fi the filter outlet. But in cases of clotting or clogging, there is a difference. Because clotting is an incident that happens a specific part of the filter. It will cause a rise in the filter uh, drop pressure. Why? Because it's a specific block, there will be a higher pressure in the inlet and a lower pressure in the outlet. But if we look at the clogging, which is a homogeneous block of 
the filter from the inlet to the outlet, you will see that there is no uh, big uh, pressure drop. So the pressure drop number does not increase. The number will remain similar uh, or the same. So both conditions will cause rising transmembrane pressure. One of them will be causing a, a high pressure drop, the other will not. So this is how a trained physician will be able to differentiate between clotting and clogging. The answer is, so what? Now I realize that the patient has clotting. As a physician, what kind of actions can I do? Well, we know it's clotting. Maybe I should modify the anticoagulation. Doing heparin anticoagulation, increase the dose. Of course, in this case, very difficult to do so. Increase the blood pump speed. In this case also will help uh, prevent the clotting. Also go from 150 blood pump to maybe 170 or 180. One other thing I could do is increase the pre-dilution. So in this case, as a trained physician, I would increase the blood pump speed and increase the pre-dilution in anticipation of this clotting that could be happening inside the membrane. Remember, you just started the CRT. You don't know if this minus 100 uh, is good or bad. So you want to look at the history uh, of the pressures. How do we do that? We very simply uh, go on the machine, choose history, uh, and from the history, we choose the pressures. And from the pressures, you can see the axis, the filter, the effluent, the return. So for example, uh, if you want to see the axis pressure, uh, you put them all like this, and you can see the history of the axis, uh, where it was and started, and where it is now. Same with TMP, you can choose TMP, uh, or, or you can choose, as we explained, pressure drop. Uh, and that's what was very well explained. Of course, here, because it's a simulation, uh, there is saline, there is no human blood. I'm unable to see uh, transmembrane pressures, axis and the pressures, as what you would see uh, in a normal thing. So looking at the history of the pressures, you see the pressure uh, history menu, uh, you will be able to diagnose that this is a pressure accumulation problem. Now go back to uh, the uh, uh, CRT prescription. Uh, of course, the decision now, uh, as we explained, is to have more pre uh, dilution. Uh, one of the things we adjust, we go to pre dilution, uh, have the pre dilution to be uh, uh, 750 uh, instead of 500, uh, but also uh, go away to the post dilution uh, and make it less. So make it 250, for example, uh, and then also go to the blood pump, go from 140, for example, to 160. Uh, confirming all, you will see that we have, uh, in this case, uh, maintained a very high dialysis dose of 30 ml, which, was, which we want better clearance, but we were able to achieve uh, a lower filtration fraction at 14% uh, and, and to try to bypass this problem uh, uh, of the pressure, filter pressure accumulation uh, for this patient. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Atar. And Dr. Atar is actually with us now. And I would like to ask him just a quick uh, question because of the uh, time uh, constraint. So, uh, Dr. Atar, uh, would you consider switching heparin to citrate in this case? And when do you think about switching heparin to citrate or use citrate, uh, uh, you know, bit, you know, more than heparin? That's uh, the, my first question. My second question, if you increase the, if you dilute the circuit and you give more uh, dialysis uh, fluid pre-dilution, how would this affect the dialysis adequacy? I know that you increase the blood flow rate and you're already giving three liter, which is the dose is good, but just in case how you um, calculate or recalculate or reassess the dialysis adequacy in this patient, please mute, uh, this, uh, unmute yourself. Um, thank you, Professor uh, Hosseini, um, for um, the uh, kind introduction. And uh, I will, there are two parts. I will try to answer the, um, the first part before uh, about regional citrate anticoagulation. Of course, regional citrate anticoagulation uh, is the uh, number one choice of uh, anticoagulation for CRF. So, uh, as per the KDGO guidelines, and, and as you will see throughout uh, the course, uh, that uh, uh, training that you would receive that uh, uh, citrate anticoagulation, uh, if available, uh, would be the uh, anticoagulant of choice in CRF. So, uh, definitely, for example, uh, we were sharing, of course, 
uh, this patient was started on heparin anticoagulation uh, or no anticoagulation, uh, and then things are getting worse throughout the treatment. Uh, we are trying to adjust the CRT parameters, the CVHDF prescription, in order to prolong the filter life. Uh, ideally, uh, uh, you know, if that uh, prolong, you prolong it for a few hours, uh, to maybe 24 hours, uh, ideally, if you connect the patient again, uh, probably uh, if you can switch to citrate, that would be great uh, because that's how we have evidence that it prolongs the filter lifespan, uh, less bleeding risk, and less clotting risk. Uh, so this definitely would suit that patient very much uh, from the training. If you get the full course, of course, you will see that uh, this is a high bleeding risk patient and that we are doing zero anticoagulation. So definitely uh, a candidate for site. And uh, for the second part, you know, we were talking about the pre-dilution or dilution fraction. Uh, when you introduce a lot of pre-dilution or when you increase pre-dilution, you compromise efficiency. So there is a drop in the uh, efficiency of the CRRT. Uh, there is a special formula uh, called the dilution fraction that shows us exactly uh, how much is the delivered dose uh, uh, after you have done your pre-dilution. So when you've done pre-dilution, uh, for example, uh, the dose, your CRRT dose is 30 ml per kg per hour. Half of it is the diffusion, half of it is convection. And when you do convection, maybe you do half of that into pre, half of post. When you do half of pre, uh, you are compromising. Uh, this is no longer a 30 ml per kg per hour. It becomes, for example, 28 ml per kg. So the more pre-dilution you do, the less is the delivered dose versus the prescribed dose. So in general, uh, we, we need to be careful that we uh, try to prescribe higher, uh, around 30 or 35 ml, in order to achieve 20 25 ml per kg per hour in terms of actual delivery dose. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much. Just one quick question. Why uh, regional citrate is not common in the Middle Eastern countries? I mean, and it's, it's a standard in, in, you know, where I practice in America, I think more than 80 up to 90% of our CRT machine are anticoagulated uh, via citrate. Why it's not popular uh, in the uh, rest of the world? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Dr. Hosseini. And, and the idea is in the West, of course, more than, uh, as you said, uh, almost all treatments are conducted by citrate. Uh, zero anticoagulation or heparin is very rare. Uh, some people uh, haven't seen it in many years. And of course, the reason is uh, citrate is the best because it's anticoagulating the circuit and not the patient. So the patient eventually, if you test his, um, his APTT, you test his bleeding time, his clotting time, it's all normal. Uh, but if you test the circuit, you will find that the circuit is fully anticoagulated uh, with, uh, with, with ionized calcium uh, below 0.4 uh, millimole, meaning it's fully anticoagulated. And that's why, what makes it so perfect for CRRT patients. Most patients coming post-op, active bleeding, car accidents, uh, most of them have uh, one or two at least contraindications uh, for heparin, for example. Now, the reason why in Middle East and Africa we don't have it, uh, because of many reasons, um, historically it was a dangerous treatment considered uh, high risk for developing hypocalcemia. Uh, there was a confusion around dosing. Uh, historically, it was not registered in all countries. Uh, uh, it is not available in all markets and so on. Uh, definitely, uh, we, you know, I've uh, seen citrate uh, anticoagulation treatments uh, they definitely double the filter lifespan. Uh, we talk about 48 hours to 72 hours per set. Uh, they end up saving money because you change the sets less. Uh, they are definitely saving on nurse time because you don't have to change the filter every now and then. Uh, less alarms, less alarm handling, and so on. So um, the area, the, our region, uh, is mainly heparin. Uh, or no anticoagulation region. Uh, hopefully, it moves uh, with the, with these kinds of education courses. Uh, it will move towards a citrate uh, prescription. Absolutely, I think this is one of our target uh, in disseminating uh, uh, you know the knowledge about using uh, regional citrate and CRRT machine in the developing countries in the Middle Eastern uh, countries, Africa, Asia. I think that's a very important uh, uh, tool to educate and to orient people about the importance of using uh, regional citrate instead of heparin. By the way, 
citrate has many other um, benefits and heparin also has many other drawbacks. I'm a bone specialist. I, I know that heparin also can affect the bone. Of course, not on the short term during the CRRT, but if the patient end up on you know long term dialysis, this might increase the bone loss. But anyway, that's that's very important. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Attar, and uh, we are very happy that you are part of uh, this uh, educational program. And we'll see you again and again in further workshops. Now, thank you, Professor uh, Hosseini, for this opportunity. Thank you. Yes, sir. We have Dr. Uh, Jacob. Dr. Jacob is a critical care uh, physician. Uh, he's originally from Spain and he's uh, practicing in Portugal. And he is uh, one of the best uh, teacher in the critical care nephrology. And he's going to show us just an example of an article that we are going to discuss throughout the uh, program. And he's going to show us, uh, you know, a patient with um, HRS, you know, hepatorenal syndrome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacob Bakruisa. I'm a specialist on internal medicine and a specialist on intensive care medicine. Currently working as a senior consultant at the intensive care unit. Hospital Garcia de Orta is one of the central university hospitals on the south side of Lisbon City in Portugal, uh, Europe. I'm also a board of the Critical Care Nephrology Fellowship. Um, for me today is going to be the one to talk the last. Uh, I'm going to talk about the journal club. Uh, specifically today, we're going to talk about uh, the hypothorenal syndrome. And for this uh, journal club, I've chosen this paper. It's recent, recently published at the beginning of this year in AJKD, kidney dysfunction in the setting of liver failure, core curriculum 2024. It's an absolutely beautiful and uh, elegant paper that it really deserves the, the, the reading. Now, the uh, format of the journal club is through a clinical case. And um, after the clinical case, we'll make a couple of questions in this case. And because of a problem with the time, it's gonna be just one question. And through the question, there's an explanation. Now, talking about our clinical case, the clinical case today is a 55-year-old male to cast an alcoholic cirrhosis admitted on our intensive care unit for abdominal pain and weakness. The temperature at the main entrance is 37.5. The heart rate is 20, 100, 20, um, 20, uh, 20 and, uh, 25, 125 per minute. His uh, breathing rate is 25 per minute. The blood pressure is uh, systolic of 90 and diastolic of 43, meaning that we have um, mean arterial pressure of 58 millimeters of mercury. The physical examination is jangelous uh, ascites with diffused tenderness of the abdomen and low extremity edema. On the lab, we have a wet blood, uh, wet blood count of around uh, 23,000 neutrophils, 98%, hemoglobin, 12.4 platelets, 135,000 CRP, 78, PCT, 34. The sodium is 130, potassium is 0 4.0, and the creatine is 1.8. The bilirubin total is 8.1 million per deciliter. Now the urine analysis, there are no blood or protein, or protein they are staying healing cast and the sodium is uh, under 10 max per liter and the creatinine is 100 milligrams per deciliter. So in other words, we are not high in other rather than the uh, than an alcoholic cirrhosis is compensated leading and hypothorenal syndrome type one, HRE1 due to an spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and SVP. Now, this patient is already taking triazone 2 grams per day intravenous. He's taking also telodepressing 4 milligrams per day, continuous intravenous. Uh, we have already performed a paracentesis uh, withdrawing 4 liters of uh, exudate, and the patient is also doing a few regimen and taking few regimen 8 milligrams intravenous. And the question is this, what is the most appropriate next step in this patient? in this particular setting. And the options for the answer are number one, increase intravenous furosemide, 
Number two is new large volume paracentesis. Number three is albumin for at least 48 hours. Number four is renal replacement therapy. Number five is the schedule a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt dips. And the question, the right question is this one is number three is albumin for at least 88 hours. And the reason for this is this every time we look at the at the current literature, the use of albumin, we can realize that every time that we can combine the terlipressin plus albumin in these cases, Ortega et al. They did they, they perform um, on on the rest of they perform uh, very nicely. They use the the uh, the terlipressin and album, and when they compare with the terlipressin, you can see here on the left as the serum creatinine decrease much faster and better than on the totally present arm. And when we look at the probability of survival here again, we have the totally present plus albumin against the totally present. As you can see here, the probability of survival is much better. It's much better. In other words, this kind of patients will live much longer than the other ones. Now, why the totally present and why using the combination between the totally present and the albumin? As we can see here on yellow, on the yellow line is the, uh, the, the arm of the totally present use. And on gray line, we have the passive. Again, we have the creatinine serum levels. And as we can see here, all the patients receiving the totally present as a basal pressure. On this specific setting, they improve much better their acute kidney injury. When we see and uh, we, when we look at the cumulative incident renal replace of renal replacement therapy, again in yellow, we have the totally pressing in gray, the placebo, one, as we can see here, this kind of patient receiving totally pressing, they didn't need renal replacement and therapy as usually as the other. When we look at the survival overall, again, in yellow, we have the total depression and in gray, we have the placebo. Again, the survival overall is much better on the total depression arm rather than on the placebo, uh, placebo arm. And as you can see, every time that we have to look at the use of partial pressure in this specific setting, there are different options. We have the adrenaline, we have the partial pressing, we have any other. But the most relevant or, uh, say, accepted choice uh, recently or uh, currently is the is the total depression. When we talk about the dose and the albumin dose in the standard dosing, we will say that on day one, we will give the patient 25 grams of albumin, 12.5% intravenous every six hours, and from day two, and therefore the dosing will change for will change for a, a dosing between 20 and 25 grams per day. So the answer to or the right answer to the previous question is why using albumin in this specific setting because the albumin increase the totally pressing effectiveness. This is just a uh, small example of where we pretend with a with a, um, a with a journal club. Thank you so much for your attention. That's a great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jacob, for uh, this nice presentation. Just a quick question. Would you stop Lasix uh, in this case? And the other question, is there is any head-to-head -head comparison between different kinds of uh, anotropic uh, or vasopressor agents, uh, you know, norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin, telepressin, and HRS? Well, true is that uh, when, when, when you look at the papers, uh about choosing the right the right vasopressor as you know in the intensive care we use the, the norepinephrine and the noradrenaline uh, usually the totally pressing is not a is the it's not the vasopressor of choice but in this kind of setting is definitely the the vasopressor of choice actually not only on the intensive care but on the on the common uh, gastroenterology words they use it daily on this specific setting, specifically on the cirrhosis. So uh, when you look at the papers, uh, which one is better, the totally pressing or the, or the norepinephrine or the other ones, you can realize that the best choice and the first choice definitely, definitely is the totally pressing. And uh, the best choice 
definitely is the associations between the the the, the albumin as you as you know the use of albumin in the, in the intensive care is extremely extremely controversial there are a lot of paper talking about the use of the the potential use on the on the refractory septic shocks and all of them or maybe let's say that 80 90 percent of those papers they finish in nothing so they finish saying okay you better don't use the albumin but in this specific setting yeah for sure and this is and the reason for that as i told you on the question is because the association between the tidally pressing and the albumin improves dramatically the the effect the vasopressor effects uh, coming from the tidally pressing so yeah the tidally pressing for sure very nice would you stop uh, the diuretic in this case the lasix uh, uh, I don't know. It's a tough one. <laughs> that one is a tough one. Um, that's a very tough one. I don't know. I don't. I don't have a. I mean, I have my my answer for that, but it's it's, it's controversial. It's it's very very. It's very tricky. It's very okay. tricky. One more question. Um, so the standard of care here in the uh America is to give octeriotide albumin midodrin for floor patients who are not uh, shocked and of course visopressin for ICU patients who have uh, some kind of shock so uh, I, I haven't heard anything about octeriotide or so, somebody uh, uh, you know somebody else was asking about sandostatin in general so uh, can you please comment on that well, here in Geo, we are using the 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 um, asthma suppressor on this specific setting. We are using the tolipresin and we are using the the noradrenaline, other but midronin we never ever use. And in some of the cases, we can even use the vasopressin. But as as you know, the vasopressin, the only uh, the only the only positive uh, point on the association on this kind of, of, of a specific situation is when we associate with the norepinephrine, with the norepinephrine because you can reduce them dramatically the levels of the norepinephrine. So you have to use two vasopressors in association one with the other. But in this kind, in this specific setting, it's much better associate just the albumin with the totally pressing and you have to use just one vasopressor, not two vasopressors. Now, if you talk about, if you ask me about the, the experience with the medronine, we don't use it at all. Uh, there is amazing because there's a, a very nice paper, as you know, the hypothorenal syndrome and the, and the acute kidney injury in the setting of the cirrhosis is uh, uh, in a specific uh, setting uh, that is has the same mortality rate for the last 25, 30 years, but there's a paper coming from the United States that well, they use the medronine and and the and the totally pressing as vasopressors, something that we don't use uh, usually, and they could uh, they they really reduce the mortality. is is very 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 rare. For example, here in Europe, we don't have that situation. I mean, our survival rates are the same for the last 25, 30 years. Meaning that probably probably is not only about using the totally pressing or norepinephrine, but also using the way you do it. But that's the question. I don't know. I don't know. What about octeriotide or sandostatin analog? The the sorry? Octeriotide or sandostatin analogs? Ah uh, yeah, yeah. The, the octeriotide and the sandostatin. Yeah, but it's that depends on the on the on the on the uh, clinical evolution uh, because the octotide and the sandostatin is, is let's say is at the beginning of the process not at the end of the process when you get to a point where the patient is is, is in refractory shock in this kind of settings you will need something harder so no, no sandostatin and, 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 and octotide the octotide is let's say is is, is uh, you have to use it uh, on, on, a, on a previous time on a, on, a, on a previous time of the of the setting not not that not that late very good very good thank you so much for that and uh, I see some question about the diagnosis and of course this is a diagnostic dilemma is it HRS or some something on both on this uh so anyway that's another discussion we don't have time for this now but I really appreciate uh, everyone for contribution uh, to our induction meeting today. I put uh, uh, some of the links for the program. If you are interested, if you haven't finalized uh, your application yet, please go ahead and do this. There is uh, some question regarding scholarship and I uh, bought uh, Dr. Rola Osman 
number. I haven't asked her to do this, but I'm sorry. So you have already her number on the chat box. If you have any question regarding the scholarship, you can text her on WhatsApp. Um, and with that, uh, uh, I think if you have any further question, I'll be happy or Dr. Ricardo, Dr. Jacob, uh, Dr. Craig, Dr. Khaled, Dr. Rola, Dr. Yasser, uh, Marcos, and uh, all, all of us will be happy to answer your questions. So please feel free to contact us uh, on WhatsApp or our email address. And also there is uh, info and the management team with us. You can, uh, when you uh, log in to the our landing page or website, you can see further information and the email addresses if you have any question regarding the program. With that, I think we are going to conclude. Um, the, there is a question regarding when the meeting starts, when the fellowship starts and starts on May uh, 20, which, which will be Monday, so Monday, May 20. We are going to have another meeting on May 15 uh, called the uh, onboarding meeting for those who finalize their uh, application. And with that, uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you so much for your contribution and engagement and uh, uh, um, attendance today. And um, have a, a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.